Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is noon hour Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here in our Think Tech studios uh, downtown Honolulu, momentarily and electronically transposed to Waimanalo with the on a very calm uh, corner wind day there with the Makapu in the background. Anyway, today joined in the studio by none other than Josh Levy, the coordinator of our unmanned air systems work at UHARL. And if the two of you, if you and I are here, that means that's only half the group's working right now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Hey, thanks for coming on, Josh, and taking a bite out of the day here. In fact, this is about the only time we actually get to sit back and talk about things that uh, aren't associated with our daily pursuits. And yep. March was a complicated and exciting month, and April's turning out to be not a lot different, right, at this yep. point in time? just keeps building and building. Yeah, sure does. And we are enjoined in absentia, actually, by none other than Dwight Takano from our, uh, our uh, executive offices at UH. He can't make the show, but we wanted to uh, we put this particular program on because of something that, that Dwight inspired. We want to thank Dwight very much for that, and we'll explain that more to our folks here as time goes on. But what we had, and Josh was a big part of it, uh, and Dwight created it, was a drone boot camp held at the University of Hawaii Les Murakami Stadium uh, two weeks ago this Friday. Yep. And uh, this was something that came out of the blue, uh, if, if Dwight Takeno's mind is considered blue, <laughs> but it was a brilliant idea, and it was so well executed, and I think so well valued, drone boot camp. What were your thoughts going in, Josh, when you first heard Dwight say, let's go do a drone boot camp? What did you think? So, so this all started because I was telling, telling Dwight about these UH-centric uh, Friday Fly Days we're having on campus. Friday Fly Days. Friday Fly Not Days. Friday Fly Days. Friday Fly Days. Yeah, no food. People are still hungry while we were flying. Okay, yeah, all right. Food comes after. Okay. Um, especially for Dwight. And then, um, so I was telling him about these Friday Fridays we're having at, at UH, and, and he kind of all of a sudden clicked and said, let's open this up to the public. We have to have everyone else also understanding all these rules and regulations too. Um, and so I immediately spun into a, a bit of a panic, um, mm -hmm. trying to understand Good. exactly how many people were going to be there, what was going on. What we're going to do. Exactly, yeah. How we're going to actually figure this thing it. out. Yeah, a lot of different questions that had to be answered. But, you know, Dwight did, did a, an amazing job of kind of, setting everything out straight, understanding that what, you know, kind of the, 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 what the method was for all this madness, and um, it actually turned out to be a really great event. Let's take a look at some uh, B-roll you got there, Ray, that might show what this was all about. There we go. So uh, I think we can talk over this, but what we have here is this some video taken by one of the local TV stations, and it was uh, showing people gathered around, talking, sharing information, drones on the table, equipment, pieces, how you assemble them, the very basic rudiments. Boot camp for sure, right? This was <laughs> exactly. true boot camp. Yeah, and so the, the the main purpose for this was just for, for folks that had that had bought drones, whether it's for Christmas or for you know Valentine's Day, whatever you were buying drones for, and and the, the people were just too afraid to take them out of the box and fly, and they didn't know where to go. They were afraid of breaking them. Um, they just needed to have someone sitting there next to them, helping them, essentially just watching them set this stuff up, and having the the confidence, um, kind of building that confidence as they do that. I certainly learned what that was all about, and I didn't really understand until it was over what our Intention really was, even though I went through a couple of panning meetings and discussions. But exactly right, a lot of, we, we deal with these all the time. So to us, it's not a big deal. Second to, nature. To take them apart, put them together. We have Noah who can take them far apart, so that you <laughs> can't put them back together if that's your desire. Yeah. But uh, and we use them all the time. So to us, it's like second nature, perhaps. But I can under, certainly understand how other people who've not had that opportunity are going to be a little bit skittish, not quite sure what this thing does or what, what button to push or what order to push them. And so I was struck by the group that I was assigned to work with, a couple of different groups, that they basically want to know how do you take it out of the box, what do you look at to see if all the pieces are there, where do you put the batteries, how do you determine if the batteries are good, and then when you start thinking about flying, what do you have to think about when you get ready to commission this thing to go into the air and launch it? Yep. So, uh, what were your thoughts on, on the interactions you had with folks? Um, I, I thought it was great. I mean, especially um, in, in the beginning, you know, we would go and we brought everyone down to one of the dugouts and had a TV screen up and we were showing them before we even took the drones out the box. It was illustrating, you know, some of the rules and regulations with the FAA and, you know, throughout the state and understanding where you can and you cannot fly and why you can and cannot fly. And so tr really getting that message across, you could see people's minds clicking and, like, understanding the importance of, of, of learning where you can and cannot fly 
in terms of you know uh, temporary flight restrictions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, that was kind of the most rewarding part for me. Uh, in, in addition to actually saw a couple of photos just then of teaching these really young kids how to how to fly these these aircraft. I mean, you know, these kids grew up playing video games from when they were three years old. So having so did you? A, so, well, actually, I, I did was, not. I grew yeah. up in a time way before <laughs> video games were even invented. Yeah, that's true. So I, I definitely have a little bit more experience playing video games than that. But it, I mean, these kids, it was it was second nature. You know, he was out there flying that thing with the utmost confidence. You know, he was looking at the screen like it was second nature to him. So it was, that was also very, very rewarding. And can only imagining you know, where these kids are going to be in 10 years from now, what, you know, what type of technology they're going to be dealing with, and what kind of good they'll be using these kinds of aircraft for. That's pretty cool. I had a similar reaction when we had the TV screen going and, and the basic fundamental rules. I think that was the first time a lot of those people had ever even heard or understood that there are a set of rules, and there's a place you can go, even as complex as it might be, to find more. And the kind of questions they were asking, like, what is a notum? How do I file a notum? What phone number do I call? Those are really good questions. And I think we do owe the public that attended a report back, uh, as we said we would. So I actually, I haven't actually sent them out an email, so maybe they're listening today, but I, so I, um, I helped because um, through, you know, through my job at UHARL, I put together a website, www.uas. Uh, uh, HawaiiUAS.com. Ray, can you get that up on the screen? I'll, I'll also make sure that I have the right uh, URL in there. I can give it to you guys later. But um, part of that is a resources page that shows you all the different locations to the FAA website and various other you know, AMA websites showing you where you can look all this stuff up. And one of them is a link onto where to file a NOTAM and even an instructional video of how to file a NOTAM online. That's great. There's a video that explains how to do that. Yeah. In fact, videos like these two or three minute videos, they're all over the web. They're pretty cool. Yeah, and these but are very instructive. If we could maybe keep pulling them together in terms of understanding airspace, for example, understanding class B versus class D airspace, there's, there's videos out there. There's work that uh, AMA has. There's work that uh, work that um, uh, aircraft owners and pilots association has done. So we can become that center point, collecting and then displaying that information, making it available to people. Yep. But I'll tell you again. Uh, I just can't go. I can't. I can't. Uh, Thank Dwight enough for having thought this problem up and then thought the solution up at the same time. Uh, and once again, it, it just struck me that we're providing very basic essential information, as we should be doing, as part of our educational outreach, and giving people a comfort place that they can turn to that someone else has been there before and we can answer questions. The kind of questions I was uh, asking, what I found myself doing was asking them questions about how they're going to be ready. Okay, which way is the wind blowing? When this thing launches, which way is it likely to drift? Is there some problem there? Hmm, right. Probably downwind. What's downwind? How do we think about what's downwind? How do we think about what happens if there's a failure in the GPS or some other issue? Yeah. So uh, getting them to think about which way the wind blows, uh, are you prepared? Have you got the primary flight information understood? Have you got the secondary information on the tablet? Is that available? Do you understand what's going on there? Do you understand what to do when there's a problem? Uh, those are really essential discussions, and it was cool. I didn't have to do any lecturing or talking. I simply asked them what they're doing about it, and they tell me what they're thinking about. And we found some issues, and it was, it was just, uh, I think they know someone they can talk to now, should they ever have a question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's all the stuff that we go through in our heads before we take off, but it's just kind of socializing the idea in their heads because they haven't had that experience. I mean, I know especially for me personally, it took me, you know, a couple of tries before I would actually be able to go fly competently and, you know, understand all those environmental impacts and what would happen, you know, if GPS cut out and all those situations, whereas, you know, all that information that we already have with us, we can impart on them and they can, you know, start off flying, you know, a couple of steps ahead, or, you know, to begin with, which is really great. So the question, and we have to involve Dwight in this question, and the answer to it is, how do we extend this beyond just that one-shot event at UH, which we probably had, what, 90 people in attendance mm -hmm. at, something like that? Because we've got schools all over the, all over the state. We've got uh, schools that are in the various airspace areas, schools that are remote from airspace. So there's areas where there's different considerations that have to apply. So it would be very rewarding and very useful and very effective if we could take this show on the road. Rather than make people from Wailua come into UH, we go to Wailua and yep. repeat the thing out there. Uh, in, in, in fact, there could probably even be a classroom version that doesn't even have any flying in it, just the very issues we talked about at the very beginning get the thinking going. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
Now, of course, you and I have a lot of free time, so we can, <laughs> we can take on these actions. Uh, we don't have any proposals to do. We don't have any FAA IPP to worry about. We don't have uh, aero environment. Schedule's wide open. It was yeah. wide open, so we could uh, take this on. But we should really uh, find a way to uh, have Dwight help us figure out how to make this a university extension of some kind. Yeah, I think mean, the important part, as you're mentioning, is we have to have other folks, other instructors that are competent that can you know, be able to, to lecture with us. And so we have a, a pretty good base of a group of people that we can reach out to for this. So, so a cool idea, then taking that for thought for a minute, if we took this and, and cored it down to the absolute base minimum that could occur in a classroom as part A, and part B would be a classroom plus the field, mm -hmm. sometimes you may not be able to get access to the field. Sometimes you could have a liability issue or you may not have permission. So well, the weather is today. Yeah, as yeah, <laughs> you know very well. Yeah. And uh, so a classroom version and a classroom plus version, even a tent using uh, uh, the micros, our, our, uh, our uh, yeah, the micros or our, our DNLR tent, mm -hmm. and uh, operate in, in outside in the tent, for example. But if we could sort of package it that way, and then take that show on the road and have somebody at it at very at very, the various schools uh, become competent at that level, and they can carry on locally exactly. after we've had a first session. As George Purdy says, become the UAS champion of that school. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. That would be, a, and we got guys like Derek uh, Estabil out in. Uh, at Castle would probably jump on that. We've got lots of people who would be very interested in, in doing that. Of course, they have a lot of free time, too, just like <laughs> you and I have. But I think exactly. that's really an obligation we need to take on. We need to figure out how to make that happen. And with this uh, activity taking place at the Capitol on uh, Res Joint Resolution 143, which is going to put together a, a working group to try to figure out how to work all these problems of UAS in Hawaii, this actually fits into that fairly well. Mm -hmm. I think we all know education is going to be the number one element here that we need to get the word out. Absolutely. I mean, and even going back to talking about the success of, of this, of this, you know, first event. You know, I've been getting emails over the past couple of weeks asking, "Oh, no, I, I missed it. I'm so sorry. Is ah. there going to be another one? You know, can we get this going again?" On a whole, so, so we got to go do it again. Yeah, for sure. And we still have to do your in, in, internal UH fly day, fri, Friday fly days. <laughs> that tomorrow's yep. Friday. Well, I, so I, I'm actually planning one for next week. Next week, okay. Yep. All right. So, yeah, anyone that's listening that wants to come out to UH um, next Friday, we'll be having it, and I'll, I'll send out an email to the, to the folks that, that are Are involved. we going to include the folks who came to the, uh, to the boot camp? So I, I, I want to try and keep these, um, the, the Friday Friday one specific to UH, just because okay. it's a little bit of a smaller crowd. It doesn't have to involve other people taking a lot of time logistically. It, it's, it's a little bit more of a kind of a pop-up event. But in terms of having a, um, you know, open to the public, I think every six months we're going to start doing the, the large-scale ones at, at Les Murakari, and then, you know, starting to expand out to these other schools as, as things go on as well. I would think uh, once a month wouldn't be, we, we could probably handle once a month and never run out of people to deal with on <laughs> Oahu alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every other two weeks, Friday fly day, at UH. and then interstice with that, they won for the public. That's so. going to, my, my, my wide open schedule is very easy. Your wide that. open schedule's got used up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we got to get some other people in on this as well. Yeah. But the whole issue of education, you know, we just had a discussion with the FAA this week, and there's apparently a lot of uh, people who don't understand certain of the rules, uh, or they're, for some reason, are uh, having errors with their equipment or problems of some kind, and, and beginning to generate potential interactions with air traffic. Mm -hmm. So part of our educational campaign has to be aimed in that direction. So I think the issue is more than just the, the, the getting to know you and the, the fun aspects of this thing. There is some, some serious overtones here that we have to work on, and the education is the first line of defense and getting that to be correct. Yep, absolutely. And that was that was the goal of, of, of this uh, boot camp was just the initial understanding that there is something out there that can, you know, help you fly safe and fly smart. And if you do need some more resources, you know where to contact us, you know how to go online and go and find this other stuff in as fact, well. We ought to have people watching this. How do they get a hold of you so they can sign up for the next one? <laughs> I'm gonna give them your email address. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give them back to yours. So <laughs> let's put it up there. Should... Yeah, so it's uh, L E V Y J O S H at A R L dot Hawaii dot so you're, you do it backwards, Levy Josh. Yeah, because I'm not the only Josh Levy apparently in, in okay. Hawaii. So, so Levy Josh at ARL. ARL. Dot Hawaii. Dot, dot edu. Dot Hawaii. Dot edu. Yep. Okay, so that's how to get a hold of you and, mm -hmm. and become uh, either a contributor, a participant, or uh, just asking questions. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. To our drone boot camp, that we should call it the. Dwight Takeno <laughs> drone boot camp to make sure it has recognition as to where it came from. And I again, I, I just can't imagine having thought of this myself, 
because mm -hmm. it's something we just don't come across. We thank Dwight uh, over and over again for having the, the audacity to ask the question. And the tenacity as the well. The tenacity yes. to yeah. put it together and deal with all the issues he had to deal with. Uh, Absolutely. But not also thank the other UA staffers who took care of publicity and, and uh, getting the stadium available. Mm -hmm. Glenn Nakayo down there at the stadium making it available to us time and again. Uh, and then the other folks who came from industry, uh, Michael Motos and Kainoa Jimenez came, and uh, Mike Elliott. Mike Elliott came, mm -hmm. and uh, Kevin from uh, uh, the consulting firm. We had a couple of consulting firms. In fact, one of the discussions we had right there was, hey, why don't we take these guys who are using drones form uh, formally and professionally, and form some kind of a hui, some kind of a collective that they can get together and have a place to exchange information of the type they need, yeah, in order to professionally succeed in. Uh, making good use and, and winning hearts and minds uh, with this capability. Yep. So I think uh, that's another obligation we have in our free time, our spare <laughs> time to take up and go make that happen as well. Yeah, uh, every time I come on here, Ted, there's just more and more stuff on my list to do. That's good. And if, if, uh, if, if a guy like Greg Nakano was on here, he'd have even more because there's just <laughs> no end of bright ideas that, uh, that, uh, that uh, fall out onto the table here. So let's talk after the break here, let's talk about, uh, again, maybe some real serious thoughts about how we extend this and additional content to add to it. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. <music> Folks, Ted Rawson here at the noon hour in our Think Tech studios downtown Honolulu with uh, Josh Levy from UHARL joining us again. Josh, a uh, frequent flyer on the show, and in, in absentia, our great friend Dwight Takeno from uh, the administrative side of UH. Dwight, I hope you're watching this because we're setting you up for lots of uh, future obligations here <laughs> uh, since you started this whole process. Anyway, we were just talking uh, before the break about the, the incredible success of this idea of a drone boot camp. And now, if you want to uh, push it forward, it would be interesting to me if we could think of the additional elements of content that go in it. We talked just about drone operations is all we talked about. We didn't really have a component that talked about the imagery that could be collected or the other things that can be done with a drone from a law enforcement perspective, environmental perspective. So we could think of other flavors to add to this Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different, you know, modules or, you know, kind of spider webs that you can take, yeah. this, take this road down, right? So we started right at the center of that web. You know, basic functionality, how can you get this thing up off the ground safely and legally? And then from then on, it just depends on what that person's motives are. How do they want to use it? Do they want to use it for cinematography, for, you know, environmental mapping, for structural inspections, for, you know, anything under the sun, really. Um, and so, you know, what needs to be done, I think we talked about this before on the show, is being able to set up these, these, these modular classes at, you know, whether it's community colleges or high schools or both um, throughout the state to, 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 to cater to each of those kind of desired fields. And that actually extends to an example that was provided to us on the show by uh, Micah Motus, who was uh, uh, at the drone boot camp, as a matter of fact, has had a lot of involvement over the last couple of years with Anui Nui Inversion School up in the Pololo Valley, up at the head of the valley. <clears throat> and the idea he had up there was that uh, that area, in the, being top of the valley, is threatened by landslides and uh, things associated with storms mm -hmm. and accumulated material blocking the passage of water. Oh, wow. and, and a lot of that could be albizia. And they're just kind of inundated with albizia trees up there. So the idea was to, uh, Mike, I hope you're watching, uh, was to uh, use the kids in the Anuinui area 
to image the area around them, generate a landmass map and a species map of where all the albizia is, Un and sort of forecast from a land ele uh, elevation model or land form model where that albizia might go if it comes down. Exactly. If one goes down, how about the next one? As the bank gets weakened, where will all the albizia go? Where's the water going to get jammed up? Where's the dam going to be? And what kind of flooding we're going to have? What a great thing for kids to see where their own house, their own school, yeah, just a, structure. a miniature disaster management model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Locally, right to your own in your own backyard. Exactly. So, the, so up, up Valley Palolo has one perspective and one issue. Nanakuli more than likely has a different issue, probably with traffic jams on the uh, on the Farrington Highway. Yep. So different locations will have a different place that, or a different utility that could come into the picture. Mm -hmm. And. Um, in our spare time, uh, great projects to put together. Absolutely, and, and that's why it's great to, to start getting in touch with guys like Micah um, and, and Kainoa as well, who can go and champion this in, in other locations throughout the state and throughout, throughout the island. So, uh, illustrating, how would you, as, an, as a practitioner of the art, how would you illustrate to a class uh, the issue of photo mosaicing, for example, or mm -hmm. the issue or the, the technology of forming a digital elevation model. Those aren't terms that resonate with most people. Right. So, well, that, over that's to you. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. The answer actually can be told throughout an entire semester. So that's what one of the, <laughs> right. one of the, one of the professors in at well, UH... Not, you can't use that excuse. No, well, <laughs> so, well so I, I'm going I'm to start talking a little bit about some one of the classes in, in the geography department at UH where the, the whole goal is to have these students understand at the mathematical level how those softwares and how those systems ah, work. You said the magic word, math. Yeah. Okay. And so it's, I mean, it's definitely more than what I can get into, and honestly, a, a little bit over my head in terms of the, the magic that happens in that black box. Um, but what, what photogrammetry is essentially is understanding how different pictures taken from different locations relate to one another. And from there, you can build a three dimensional perspective from various areas of a scene. And so. You know, it takes a, a pretty significant amount of, of uh, computing power and, and processing power to develop these models. And you know, going back to you know the, the big data issue of you know once you go and collect all this imagery, what you know what can we do with it? Um, but yeah, so going going back to understanding exactly the fundamentals of, of photogrammetry, it, it goes back to 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 math essentially and understanding angles and and, and various other you know overlapping uh, ph photographs and all the different situations that. So at the end of the day, all this the, the imagery and the pixels and this sort of thing they degrade or de deduce or extrapolate down to a set of data in a point cloud somewhere. Exactly. Yep. And that then that point cloud has to be manipulated in such a way that the edges between adjacent photographs are f are forced into compliance with each other based on shapes and colors perhaps. Yeah, exactly. So looking at looking at gradients between between edges and colors exactly and trying to find out how those images align with one, with one another and then looking at how the images differ based on the perspective of the camera at that location, you can determine the shape of that object or the shape of that terrain. I can think of about a, a succession of about 3 or 4 Picture sets that show that individual pictures, and then here's the first lash up of the at the interface, and then here's the completed lash up, and then here's the trigonometric, trigonometric corrections required to make the three dimensional point cloud come out in some ways. So I can see how that would progress. I think kids even in a fourth grade would pick that up right away. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the coolest part about it is actually being able to visualize this stuff. Exactly. I mean, the, <clears throat> when I first got hooked on, on this, it was you know, after going out and flying, which is all, was all fun, but then going out and, and actually creating one of those three-dimensional models and being able to kind of essentially fly through it, um, that's what really gets kids excited. And it's That is cool. Okay, you could take your school that way. You could take the environment around your school, your soccer field, whatever it might be. Exactly. The traffic situation. So we, I, I think we have an obligation to to illustrate that somehow, to express that. We have lots of, we have lots of obligations, Ted. Yeah, the longer the show goes, the more we're going to have, the way it looks here. But I, I do think that that's the essence of the, of the user part of this. And then there's a part that I get excited about, and that's the insides in what's making the drone work. Mm -hmm. uh, we just fly them, but there's more high tech going on inside that little $79 drone than we have in our cars. Yep. And uh, understanding how that was conceived, how that was coded, how that was verified, how that's made reliable, all these things to me are uh, the application side that are really exciting. And, and how you can uh, improve it. I, exactly. How do you yeah. make it work for you? Yeah. And now we have to get, that brings up Domerat Asimov, we have to get on this show <laughs> and the EPSCOR grant at some point in time and talk about that. But if we could get kids interested in what's under the hood, both on the analysis side and from what makes it work side, I think we'd have a really informed workforce uh, coming out of this. Not just a workforce, but a thinking force that is necessary to 
take advantage of all this in a, in a practical way. Well, exactly. I mean, the, the only way that you're going to improve on something is if you understand that entity already innately, right? You have to understand it fully to say, okay, to make it do this, I need to be change, making these changes or this thing could be done better if I do it this way instead. So taking this, looping this back to Dwight Takeno's <laughs> drone boot camp, our next drone boot camp, we need to have the people who contribute to it or that has come to it participate suggest items that would be better in the drones they have. Exactly. And, yep. and begin getting them thinking in that, in that whole process. Getting the end user feedback. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, we've uh, we had a great discussion here about the drone boot camp. We've got to do that a lot. We've got to stop doing something else in order to do that. we got people <laughs> to talk to about that. But Dwight Takano, you're not here, but thanks a lot for the idea. And, uh, and Josh Levy, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Ted. And now it's back to work time for both of us. Yep. See you all next Thursday. <laughs>